gift of grace. What gift of grace is Jesus, my Redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and
Yeah. 
guiding me to protect me from what I can see. Lord, have your way. Lord, I believe somebody's praying for me. Once again, we get to see how God is working in the life of our church. And anytime we see somebody get baptized, it's just evidence of what God is doing. So this morning, I'm going to invite Avery Udi to come down. This is Avery Udi. Her mom and dad are Tad and Courtney. And if you're part of the family or friends, if you'd like to stand, uh, feel free to do so. But they've come this morning, or Avery's come this morning because she got saved a couple weeks ago at home. Uh, she went to mom and dad and said, hey, uh, tell me more. And they told her, and she said, I'm ready to be saved. And so she got saved at home. And it's awesome to see parents who are discipling and teaching their kids at home. And that's how God has designed it. So Avery, I want to ask you, what is your testimony? I'm not ashamed. Awesome. Well, it is my pleasure, my little sister to baptize you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried with Christ, and raised to walk a new life with Him. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. If I were to ask you to begin to take a list, a piece of paper, and begin to list all the blessings that you would say that have come into your life, and begin to write down what those blessings would be, what would they look like? What would be on that list that you would write down? I believe that we would have some similarities and things that we would have on each other's list. One of the things that we would write, I would believe, would be our family, a spouse, a husband, a wife, children, grandchildren, 
a mom or a dad, an aunt, an uncle, somebody that's really have made a difference in our lives, we would write that down as a huge blessing. Others would write down that we have friends that God had brought into your life, and you say, you know, one of the greatest blessings in my life is that friendship that God has brought. Others of you would say health. My dad used to tell me all the time that the, the greatest thing that you can have in your life is good health. Some of you would write down health. Others of you would write down First Baptist Church, and you say, you know, First Baptist Church has been one of the greatest blessings in my life. Others of you would write your job and down. And I think we would have a very similar list that we have put together, things that we would agree on that God has blessed us with. And for sure, it's not listed maybe, but it's understood our relationship with Jesus Christ. What a blessing that is. But we find that there's something missing on a list many times that we don't find or we never speak about. But I think we would agree it needs to be on our list that we would write down and we just heard it sung about. That when somebody comes to you and says that I am praying for you, I'm telling you, that's one of the greatest blessings that will ever happen in life when somebody comes to you and you know they're sincere, right? It's just not something they're saying, a phrase, well, I'll be praying. No, you know that they're going to stay up late at night. You know they're going to go to their knees for you. And when they say they're praying, man, you know they're praying for you. I'm telling you, that's one of the greatest blessings that we'll find in the world to know that someone in this world loves you enough, cares for you enough, that they are praying for you. And so I think that we would agree that we would add to our list that one of the greatest blessings in life is to have someone that you know that is praying for you, that is lifting your name up to Jesus, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and your name is placed in his care through their prayers. But there's something else that I think we ought to think about. is the blessing that the Lord Jesus Christ himself is praying for you. I'm telling you, that'll leave you speechless. That will leave you in awe to think that the Lord of lords and the King of kings is praying for you. What a blessing that is. And so today we're going to find ourselves in John chapter 17. John 17, sometimes this is called the prayer of consecration. Sometimes it's called the prayer of the departing Redeemer. Sometimes others have called it the farewell prayer. Some have really said that this is truly the Lord's prayer. He's not teaching us how to pray, that He is praying Himself. And so some have called it the Lord's prayer. But it's more typically known as the high priestly prayer of the Lord. We find it in John 17, and we're going to begin reading in verse 1. These things Jesus spoke, and lifting up his eyes to heaven, he said, Father. It's interesting to note when you study the prayers of Jesus, how many times that he said, Father, in his prayer a prayer of such intimacy uh, with the Heavenly Father. The hour has come, glorify thy Son, that the Son may glorify thee. Even as thou givest me authority over all mankind, that to all whom thou hast given him, he may give eternal life. And notice it explains it in verse 3, and this is eternal life, that we may know Thee, the only true God in Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. I glorify thee on earth, having accomplished the work which thou have given me to do. You could put your name there. 
I have glorified you. Why, I have been on earth. Verse 5, and now glorify thou me together with thyself, Father, and glory which thou hast with thee before the world was. I manifested thy name to the men whom thou gavest me out of the world, referring to the disciples. Thine they were, and thou givest them to me, and thou hast kept thy word. Now they have come to know that everything thou hast given me is from thee. For the words which thou givest me I have given to them, and they received them, and truly understood that I came from thee, and they believed that thou didst send me. I ask on their behalf. I did not ask on the behalf of the world, but of those whom thou hast given me, for they are thine, and all things are mine are thine, and thine are mine, and I have been glorified in them, and I am no more in the world, yet they themselves are in the world, and I have come to thee, Holy Father. Keep them in thy name, the name that which thou hast given me, that they may be one, even as we are one." We find ourselves in verse 12. While I was with them, I was keeping them in thy name which thou had given me, and I guarded them. Not one of them perished, but the son of perdition, the scriptures might be fulfilled. But now I've come to thee. These things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy made full in themselves. I've given them thy word, and the word has hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I did not ask thee to take them out of the world, but to keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in truth. Notice this, thy word is truth. And thou didst send me into the world. I also have sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself that they themselves also might be sanctified in truth. I did not ask in behalf of these alone, but for those who also believe in me through the word. Notice verse 20. He begins to pray for you. Not only is he praying for the disciples, now he switches and he begins to pray for those who would come, which is you and me. Verse 21 that they may be all one, even as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, they also may be in us, that the world may believe that thou didst send me, and the glory which thou had given me I have given to them, that they may be one, just as we are one, I in them and thou in me, they may be perfected in unity." that the world may know that thou didst send me and, and didst love them even as thou loved me. Father, I desire that also whom thou had given me be with me where I am in order that they may behold my glory which thou had given me. For thou loved me before the foundations of the world. Notice how he ends in the last two verses, beginning in verse 25. O righteous Father, Although the world has not known thee, yet I know thee, and these have known that thou didst send me, and I have made thy name known to them, that they will make it known, that the love wherewith thou didst love may be in them, and I in them. And may God bless the reading of his word. At this time, we find that Jesus has left that upper room in Jerusalem. It was in that upper room where he instituted the Lord's Supper, where he washed the disciples' feet. They're making their way from that upper room outside the gates of Jerusalem, down into the Kidron Valley, and up to the Mount of Olives. Last week, we saw the Olivet Discourse, and that is where Jesus is heading to the Mount of Olives. But somewhere along the way, Jesus stops, and he begins to pray this prayer in John 17. He begins to pray this prayer, and it's divided in three parts. 
The first part of the prayer is that, listen, that Jesus prays for himself in verses 1 through 6. And then we find he prays for the apostles in 6 through 19. And then Jesus prays for the followers to come. He prays for you, and he prays for me in verses 20 through verse 26. At the end of our time, there's three things that I want you to leave with after looking at this prayer. The first thing that I want you to leave with is a sense of awe. A sense of blessings upon your life that Jesus Christ prayed for you, but is also continually to pray for you. The second thing I would like for you to take away is how that you can use this prayer and that you can use this prayer to pray for yourself. It can be a model of what to pray over your life. And then the third thing, I want you to see how you can pray for First Baptist Church by using this prayer. And so pick up with me as we look at this chapter 17 together. The first thing I want you to see is that Jesus prayed for the Father to be glorified. <coughs> Eight times that we find the word glorified or glory or a rendition of that word eight times in this prayer. And five of the eight times Jesus referred to that word in his prayer for himself. Jesus is saying that I want to bring glory to the Father. The word glory is an interesting word. If we would take it all the way back to the Hebrew, it's a word kebab. It literally means heavy in weight heavy in weight. It's something that weighs greatly. Now, if we look at the verb in the Greek, uh, we would find that it means giving weight to something. But here in the context, it's a word doxo. It's a word we get our word doxology from. And so, if we are to say that we're going to glorify something, it means we put our weight behind it. We put great importance upon it. We give ourselves to it. And we find that Jesus is praying, and he says, listen, man, I just want to glorify the Father. In my earthly life here upon earth, my ministry that I had here, man, I had one thing that I desired to do, and that is to bring glory to the Father. Notice verse 1 with me. These things Jesus spoke, and lifting his eyes to heaven, he said, Father, the hour has come glorify thy Son, that the Son may glorify thee. Look in verse 4. I glorify thee on earth, having accomplished the work which thou had given me to do. Jesus' passion, Jesus' greatest passion on earth, that his life, that his weight would be behind it, all that he was, that he was glorifying the Father. But the second thing that we need to notice in this prayer, Jesus prayed for his disciples to have intimacy with the Father. He wanted the disciples to have that intimacy that he himself had with the Father. You see that in verse 2 and 3. Notice it says, Even as thou hast given me authority over all mankind, that to all whom thou hast given him, that he may give, notice the word, underline it, eternal life. In verse 3, And this is eternal life, that they, what, may know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. In verse 2, you notice the word eternal life. And when you mention eternal life, it has different nuances, different meanings to eternal life. Some think it means just the longevity, uh, that life continues, but it's much more than that. First of all, eternal life comes about when an individual understands that they are lost without a relationship with Jesus Christ. That there's no way they can have a relationship with God because their sins have separated them. And they begin to look at the cross, and they see that Jesus died on the cross and shed his blood in order that we might be forgiven of their sins. And when an individual then prays and receives what Christ has done for them, he receives then eternal life. Life now, 
and life forever will be eternal life. But that's one idea of eternal life, but there's a greater idea of eternal life that is mentioned here. Jesus is talking about having real intimacy with the Father. Notice verse 3. And this is eternal life. Notice what it says, that they may know thee. The same word in the Greek, excuse me, in the Hebrew, is a word for a man and a woman having relationships. It is that intimacy together. We find that there are two words for the word to know in the Greek. The first word to know is gnosko. It means to know by experience. It's to know by experiencing something in your life. It is to know something through a relationship. The other word is oida. Oida is knowing by facts. It's reading a book. Somebody telling you something. Which word do you think that he used here? It's gnosko. It's to know by having a relationship with someone. Paul prayed this, and he says about the Lord in Philippians 3.10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering being conformed to his death. Notice how Jesus ends this prayer in verse 25 and verse 26. O righteous Father, <coughs> although the world has not known, look, known thee, yet I have known thee, and these have known that thou didst send me. And I have made thy name known to them, and will make it known that the love wherein thou dost love me may be in them, and I in them. Jesus' greatest passion for the disciples is that they would not know facts about Jesus. Man, they would not know facts about the Bible. But you can say, man, I know the. Yesterday, I, I received a call from uh, Herman Rios, and you know, Herman's been with us a couple of times, and one of the reasons I bring him back so many times, I just love being around Herman. Herman has such a childlike faith, and when he talks about the Heavenly Father, it's almost like he's been in his presence. It's almost like he really knows him. It's almost like he's intimate with the Father. And I, when Herman leaves, I just have been so revived of that childlike faith. But that's the kind of intimacy that we all should have. And Jesus has prayed that you might know him in such intimacy when you talk about the Father. You're not talking about facts about the Father. You're talking about somebody that you have a relationship with. But thirdly, notice what he prays. Jesus prayed for the disciples' protection. Jesus was so concerned about the disciples that after he departed, that they, they would be protected. You see his great love here, his great passion for the disciples that, man, they would be protected in this world. Notice verse 9. I ask on their behalf, and I do not ask on the behalf of the world, but of those whom thou hast given me, for they are thine, and all things are mine and are thine, and thine are mine, and I have been glorified in them. He continues to express this concern and love for the disciples. He, he picks up in verse 11, and I am no more in the world, and yet themselves are. The disciples, he's saying, are, are in the world, and I come to thee, Holy Father, Keep them in thy name, thy name which thou hast given me, that they may be one even as we are one. While I was with them, I was keeping them in thy name which thou hast given me, and I guarded them, and not one of them perished. But the son, talking about Judas, a perdition, that the Scriptures might be filled. And I do not ask thee to take them out of the world, but what? to keep them from the evil one. You see, Jesus is saying to the Father, Father, I'm leaving. I'm going to back to heaven. And so what I ask of you now, 
I ask that you would protect these disciples, the 11 of them. And so I'm giving them into your care. Man, I love how Jesus loves his children. How he's desiring that they be protected. And we find he handed them over to the Father. And I want you to know that every believer is protected by the Father. And not only by the Father, catch this. The Father brings all of the Trinity to bear to protect his children. Listen to these words in John chapter 10, verse 29. It says, I want you to see the Father's robe. My Father, which has given them me, is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. Jesus is saying, look, the Father has every believer in his hand. And he said, the Father is not going to allow anyone to be removed from the Father's hand. But notice how the Son of the Trinity, the second person of the Trinity is involved. In, in John 10, 28, it says, And I give them eternal life to them, and they shall never perish, and no one is able to snatch them out of my hand. And so we are in the Father's hands, but we are in Christ's hands. But that's not all. We find that the Trinity is involved. We find that the Holy Spirit holds us as well. It says, having also believed, you were sealed in Him, referring to the Holy Spirit. And so you have the promise of the Father, of the Son, of the Holy Spirit that holds you, that you are protected for all eternity. But also, He gives you His armor to wear, seven pieces of the armor, the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the sandals with the gospel of peace, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, and prayer. And so He protects us, and we are protected in Him. And one of Jesus' greatest concerns is that you and I would be protected for all eternity, and we are in God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, we are protected. And so what have we seen? We've seen He, he prayed that the Father would be glorified through His life. He prayed that the disciples would have, what, intimacy with the Father. He prayed for our protection, but also he prayed, <coughs> excuse me, now for our unity. Look in verse 11 at the unity that he desires for us. And I am no more in the world, yet themselves are in the world. And I have come to thee, Holy Father, keep them in thy name, the name which thou hast given me, that they may be, notice the word, one, even as we are. And then go down to verse 20 with me. I do not ask in the behalf of these alone, but for those who all who believe in me through the word, that they may all be, notice the word, one, even as thy Father are in me, and I in thee, that has also been with us, that they would believe that thou didst send me, and the glory which thou hast given me, I have given to them that they may be one just as we are one. And then notice it says, in them, thou in me, that they may be perfected in unity, that the world may know that thou didst send me and didst love them even as thou didst love me. So where is our unity today? Where do we find unity in people of this diversity that are gathered here today? Where, where do we find unity? How can we say that we are one? Where do we find it? We find it in the truth. That's what we unite around. It's the truth. It's the Word of God that unites us. And so as we gather here, people that are diverse in many ways, we come united around the truth of the Word of God. We believe in the deity of Christ, the virgin birth, salvation by grace, the resurrection of Jesus on the third day. We believe that there's only one God. We believe in the Holy Trinity. The Bible is authoritative, inerrant, infallible Word of God. We believe in the local church is essential to the growth and welfare of believers. We believe that baptism is by immersion as a sign of our salvation and obedience of the Lord's command. 
We believe in the Lord's Supper as a visible symbol of Christ's body and blood given for us. You see, we believe the truth of the Word of God, and that's what unites this body together. It's not the location or, or the parking lot or the building. No, it is that we're united around the truth. You see, we find that unity is not uniformity because God has given us all spiritual gifts. We're all different in how we respond, how we act, what God has called us to do. But in those diversity of spiritual gifts, Paul would say that we are one body and we are united around the truth of Scriptures. We come united today for the Word of God. And we find that Jesus also prayed, lastly, that his followers would be sanctified. Notice with me as he, the prayer of Jesus in verse 17. He says, sanctify them in truth. Thy word is truth. You're looking for truth? Pick up the Bible. Look in verse 18. That thou didst send me into the world, I also send them into the world. And verse 19, and for their sake I sanctify myself that they themselves also may be sanctified in truth. To really understand what Jesus is talking about, you need to know what the word sanctify means. It comes from the Greek word hagios, and the word literally means to separate. And what Jesus is praying is that we will be different than the world, that we will talk different, that we will act different, that we will look different than the world, that we wouldn't talk like the world, act like the world, and become of the world. Though we live in this world, that we would be different than the world. It should come as no surprise at the high school and the junior high when they find out that you are a believer. The teacher shouldn't drop her jaw and say, you're kidding me. He goes to First Baptist Church, she goes to First Baptist Church, and oh, they said, I knew it. I could see something different. It should be no surprise in your place that you work that somebody would say, man, they're a believer in Christ. You're kidding me. You're kidding. What kind of deal is First Baptist Church running if they go there? No, it should be different. They, they should be able to see you and distinguish you, that you are different, not to be different, but because Christ lives in you, and you are growing up to be more like Christ day by day, by day. Well, I think we would all agree that this is an incredible prayer, that this is a prayer that ought to leave us in awe to think that our Lord and Savior is praying for us. But is there something more that we can do with that prayer? I believe there is. And I want you to notice on the screen, I believe that we can use that prayer to pray for ourselves. One of the things that we can pray, that you can pray that, that you would bring glory to God. Jesus' greatest passion, His greatest unction in life was to bring glory to God. And that should be your prayer, that, that your life would bring glory to God. Pray that you'll have a desire to grow in intimacy with the Lord. Men, do you know Him? Do you know him? Joe, I was thinking about John Randalls. He, was, he would always say that when he played football, he stood right behind the coach. He said, man, I would eat an onion. You remember he'd talk about that? He said, I wanted the coach to know my breath. He said, man, I want him to know that Randalls was right behind him, ready to go in the game. He said, the coach knew me. If I were to ask you today, do you know the Lord? Oh, don't tell me that he died for you and rose again. Yeah, that's true. You need to know those things. But I mean, do you know him? Have you spent time with him? Have you walked with him? Have you fellowship with him? That should be a prayer. God, I want to know you more. Thirdly, pray that you will appropriate your protection. That you would appropriate your protection. That you would understand that you are in the Father's hand that you're in the Son's hand, that you are sealed by the Holy Spirit, but you would put on the armor of God and that you would walk in the protection that He has given you. 
and then pray that you'll be united around the truth, around the Word of God, that we would be united, and then pray that you will grow up in Christ. You know, the nursery is a great place to visit in the church, but man, it's not fun for adults to be in those baby beds. We need adults that desire to grow up in Christ. So here's what I'm going to ask you to do. I'm going to ask you to begin right now to pray for yourself. I'm going to ask Josh to come up, if he would, just to pray, play that song, Somebody's Praying. And I want you to take this prayer, if you want to write it down, and that you would make it personal and say, you know what, I'm going to pray what Jesus desires for my life. And I'm going to pray it over my life. Would you do that right now? Just to begin to pray for yourself using this prayer. Sometimes we wonder about how can I pray for my life? How can I pray in such a way that honors God and honors Jesus? My friend, pray John 17. But here's what I want you to do now. Man, I want you to pray for First Baptist Church. Man, is it a part of your prayer life that you pray for the ministries, for the staff, for the leadership, for the deacons of this church. I'm going to ask our deacons if they would come. We've got some in the balcony. Make your way down. And man, just sit here on the front pew as our prayer warriors for our church. If our deacons would come now. And what should we pray for our church? Man, we should pray that every ministry and that all that we do here would bring glory to God. Amen. That everything that is done here, that our ministries would bring glory and honor to Christ. Pray that we will have a longing to know Christ. Man, that should be a longing. That we're hungry for the Word of God. Hungry to grow in Christ. That, men we would know Him. Not facts about Him. Not just things that we can spout off, but man, I know the Father. Woo! I know Him. I know the Father. And then thirdly, pray that we will be a people that will be sensitive to the conviction of God. Man, there would be a conviction. Man, we don't want to fail our brothers and sisters. Man, we don't want to fail Christ. That, man, when we sin, that, man, there would be a conviction that would come over us as a church, as individuals. And then pray that we would be united. Just not united that we can say, man, we are a united body. No, man, we're united around the Word of God. We're united around truth. And then pray that we will be mature in our walk. Oh, we love, we love new believers. Man, we've just seen the baptism of one. We love babes in Christ. But man, that's not our goal to stay a babe in Christ. Pray that we would mature, man, in our attitude, our thought, our desire, our disposition, that we would mature in Christ. So right now, as the screen is our help, and our deacons are here as our prayer warriors, let's pray over.
First Baptist Church. Make it a part of your weekly prayer. Write these down. Pray the Word of God, what, what Jesus prayed. Pray it back to Him. Man, that's powerful when you're praying the Word. So if you would, bow your heads and with one eye peeled to the screen, just begin to intercede for First Baptist Church. every head is bowed and every eye is closed just for a moment. How should we leave here today? How should we feel? What, how should we respond? I want you to leave with a sense of awe, of wonderment, of pleasure that our Lord Jesus Christ has prayed for you, but we find in Romans 8.34, He's making intercession for you right now. Ah, oh, can you believe it? Man, He's crying your name out. He's praying for you. Man, get in your car in a few moments. And just shake your head at the wonderment the pleasure, the blessings to know that Jesus has your name on his lips today. That's how much you're loved. And then second, pray with greater authority. Pray with greater power. More than bless this food, bless this one. I'm, yeah, hey, not knocking that, but listen, pray with greater authority. Pray the words of Jesus over your life. And I want to bring glory to you. I desire to know you more. I just don't want to hear facts and stuff about you. I want to know you. Pray for His protection over your walk, your life. Pray that you would grow to be more united with your brothers and sisters around the truth of the gospel. Pray that he would grow you up, grow you up into a mighty man, a mighty woman of God in him. And then thirdly, would you just not pray, God bless our church? No, would you pray specifically? Some of these items that you see on your screen that you'll write down, we'll leave them up after the service if you want to write them down, that you would write these down, that you would give a greater emphasis of praying for this church. For anything that good happens here, anything that brings glory to the Lord, listen, it's not by good scheming, good planning. It's by the Lord infusing His power and His might. And that comes through prayer. You're here today and you say, you know what? I want to be a part of a church like this that believes in prayer. Man, we would invite you to come and unite with us. We'd invite you to come and be a part of us. And if you saw the baptism earlier and you said, man, there's never been a time that I've given myself to Christ. Why don't you come today and settle it and say, man, I, I want to know Him really knowing. And maybe you're a believer here 
But there's never been a time that you've been baptized. Man, why don't you come publicly today and say, you know what? It's gone by five years, and now it's been 10 years, and it's been 15 years, and I, I've never followed him in baptism. Why don't you make that public today? I'm going to ask Josh to sing that song that we've been hearing throughout the day. Somebody's praying. I'm going to ask you, if you would, to quietly just stand to your feet with your heads bowed and your eyes closed. And I'm just going to ask you to continue to pray for yourself.